Welcome to the Sensible Socialist Podcast, a podcast for the rational left. We need to unite and work together if we're all going to get through this. Sounds like socialism to me. The amount of people I see talking about socialism positively is actually staggering. Do you think, we, I mean, do you really think that, we, that a, a proletarian revolution is just around the corner in America? Grab your pitchforks and stab your mayor. Little hero Obama. He's not my hero. I'm not talking to idiot. <laughs> <laughs> if Bernie Sanders were president, right, and he wanted to bring the same ideas as social, for socialism into this country, don't, do you think that we would benefit? I just told you Venezuela is eating rats. But I just want to go with health care. I don't want, like... <laughs> well, Same thing Hugo Chavez. Oh, oh my god. You people know? have, like, worms in your brain, honestly. Welcome to the Sensible Socialist Podcast, a podcast for the rational left. I'm your host, Kevin Gustafson, and this week I wanted to uh, kind of let you know where I've been at the last, uh, I guess, few months, even though uh, uh, it doesn't seem like that long, which is uh, I've been going back to uh, the Marx Ingalls Reader, which is edited by Robert Tucker and provides a lot of really good background and, and the you know uh, text of Marx and Ingalls that I think you know are really essential and important to read and, and to kind of get a good grasp on what Marx was really was really talking about. I would recommend it to uh, Jordan Peterson uh, instead of just reading the Communist Manifesto, though the Communist Manifesto is in Robert Tucker's Marx Ingalls Reader. But I was uh, getting to the end of the Marx Ingalls Reader and I got, um, I was at the part where they they're doing some of the Ingalls readings and I think one of the main differences between Marx and Ingalls is that Ingalls is just a hell of a lot easier to read and in some ways is more interesting that way because you don't have to go through and um, really muddle through all of the Hegelian uh, and dialectical kind of reasoning and things like that. In- Ingalls is much more of a, has a sort of journalistic style and obviously Marx had that ability but when Marx was writing you know, his works, they are decidedly not journalistic. So, I was reading through the Ingalls part, and I got to something I haven't read in a very, very long time. Ingalls is Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. And it's really not very long. It's a pretty quick read, actually. And I just thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was really well put together and really encapsulated the basics of what you want need to know, especially if you're trying to answer the question... Uh, how is it that this isn't just a utopian dream and that or even to the answer of show me a socialist country that's ever worked and I think that when you really look at the the scientific background and, and where Marx and Engels were really trying to place these, this idea of dialectical materialism and socialism and communism in terms of, in the social sciences I think it's really important how they distinguish themselves from earlier utopians and and other revolutionists. So what I wanted to do was actually sit down and go through socialism, utopian, and scientific. Read um, basically the whole thing and be able to pause and kind of stop for discussion points. So this is going to be Ingalls, Frederick Ingalls, Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific, read by yours truly on the Sensible Socialist Podcast. Socialism is, in its essence, the direct product of the recognition, on the one hand, of the class antagonism existing in the society of today between proprietors and non-proprietors, between capitalist and wage workers, on the other hand, of the anarchy of existing and production. But, in its theoretical form, modern socialism originally appears ostensibly as a more logical extension of the principles laid down by the great French philosophers of the 18th century. Like every new theory, socialism had, at first, to connect itself with the intellectual stock and trade ready at hand, however deeply its roots lay in material economic facts. The great men, who in France prepared men's minds for the coming revolution, were themselves extreme revolutionists, 
They recognize no external authority of any kind, whatever. Religion, natural science, society, political institutions, everything was subjected to the most unsparing criticism. Everything must justify its existence before the judgment seat of reason or give up existence. Reason became the sole measure of everything. It was the time when, as Hegel says, the world stood upon its head, first in the sense that the human head and the principles arrived at it by its thought claimed to be the basis of all human action and associations. But by and by, also, in the wider sense, that the reality which was in contradiction to those principles had, in fact, to be turned upside down. Every form of society and government then existing, every old traditional notion was being flung into the lumber room as irrational. The world had hitherto allowed itself to be led solely by prejudices. Everything in the past deserved only pity and contempt. Now, for the first time, appeared the light of day, the kingdom of reason. Henceforth, superstition, injustice, privilege, oppression were to be superseded by eternal truth, eternal right, equality based on nature, and the inalienable rights of men. We know today that this kingdom of reason was nothing more than the idealized kingdom of the bourgeoisie, that this eternal right found its realization in bourgeois justice, that the equality reduced itself to bourgeois equality before the law, that bourgeois property was proclaimed as one of the essential rights of man, and that the government of reason, the contrast social of Rousseau, came into being, and could only come into being as a democratic bourgeois republic. The great thinkers of the 18th century could, no more than their predecessors, go beyond the limits imposed on them by their epoch. But, side by side with the antagonism of feudal nobility and the burghers, who claimed to represent all of the rest of society, was the general antagonism of exploiters and exploited, of rich idlers and poor workers. It was this very circumstance that made it possible for the representatives of the bourgeoisie to put themselves forward as representing not just one special class, but the whole of suffering humanity. Still further, from its origin, the bourgeoisie was saddled with its antithesis. Capitalists cannot exist without wage workers, and, in the same proportion as the medieval burgher of the guild developed into the modern bourgeois, the guild journeyman and the day laborer, outside the guilds, developed into the proletarian. And although, upon the whole, the bourgeoisie, in their struggle with the nobility, could claim to represent at the same time the interest of the indifferent working classes of that period, yet the very great bourgeois movement, there were independent outbursts of that class, which was the forerunner, more or less developed, of the modern proletariat. For example, at the time of the German Reformation and the Peasants' War, the Anabaptists and Thomas Munzer, in the Great English Revolution, the Levellers, in the Great French Revolution, Babeuf. There were three heretical enunciations corresponding with these revolutionary uprisings of a class not yet developed. In the 16th and 17th centuries, utopian pictures of ideal social conditions. In the 18th, actual communistic theories. The demand for equality was no longer limited to p political rights. It was extended also to the social conditions of individuals. It was not simply class privileges that were to be abolished, but class distinctions themselves. A communist, a communism, ascetic, denouncing all pleasures of life, Spartan, was the first form of this new teaching. Then came the great three utopians, Saint-Simon, to whom the middle-class movement side by side with the proletarian still had a certain significance, Fourier and Owen, who in the country where capitalist production was most developed and under the influence of the antagonisms begotten of this, worked out their proposals for removal of class distinctions systematically and in direct relation to French materialism. One thing is common to all three. Not one of them appears as a representative of the interests of that proletariat which historically developed, had, in the meantime, produced. Like in the French philosophers, they do not claim to emancipate a particular class to begin with, but all humanity at once. Like them, they wish to bring in the kingdom of reason and eternal justice. But this kingdom, as they see it, is as far as heaven from earth, from that of the French philosophers. For, to our three social reformers, 
The bourgeois world, based upon the principles of these philosophers, is quite as irrational and unjust, and therefore finds its way into the dust hole quite as readily as feudalism and all the earlier stages of society. If pure reason and justice have not, hitherto, ruled the world, this has been the case only because men have not rightly understood them. What was wanted was the individual man of genius, who has now arisen and now who understands the truth. That he has now arisen, now that the truth has been clearly understood, is not an inevitable event following a necessity in the chain of historical development, but a mere happy accident. He might as well have been born 500 years earlier, and might then have spared humanity 500 years of error, strife, and suffering. We saw how the French philosophers of the 18th century, the forerunners of the revolution, appealed to reason as the sole judge that all is. A rational government, rational society, were to be founded. Everything that ran counter to eternal reason was to be remorselessly done away with. We saw also that this eternal reason was to be in reality nothing but the idealized understanding of the 18th century citizen, just then evolving into the bourgeois. The French Revolution had realized this rational society and its government. But the new order of things, rational enough as compared with earlier conditions, turned out to be by no means absolutely rational. The state based upon reason completely collapsed. Rousseau's social contract had found its realization in the reign of terror, from which the bourgeoisie, who had lost confidence in their own political capacity, had taken refuge first in the corruption of the directorate and finally under the wing of the Napoleonic despotism. The promised eternal peace was turned into an endless war of conquest. The society based upon reason had fared no better. The antagonism between rich and poor, instead of dissolving into general prosperity, had become intensified by the removal of the guild and of other privileges, which had to some extent bridged it over, and by the removal of the charitable institutions of the church. The, quote, freedom of property, unquote, from feudal fetters, now variably accomplished, turned out to be, for the small capitalist and small proprietors, the freedom to sell their small property crushed under the overmastering competition of the large capitalists and landlords, to these great lords and thus, as far as the small capitalist and peasant proprietors were concerned, became freedom from property. The development of industry upon a capitalistic basis made poverty and misery of the working classes conditions of existence of society. Cash payment became more and more, in Carlyle's phrase, the sole nexus between man and man. The number of crimes increased from year to year. Formerly, the feudal vices had openly stalked about in broad daylight, though not eradicated. They were now at any rate thrust into the background. In their stead, the bourgeois vices, hitherto practiced in secret, began to blossom all the more luxuriantly. Trade became a greater and greater extent cheating. The fraternity of the revolutionary motto was realized in the chicanery and rivalries of the battle competition. Oppression by force was replaced by corruption, the sword, as the first social lever, by gold. The right of the first knight was transferred from the feudal lords to the bourgeois manufacturers. Prostitution increased to an extent never heard of. Marriage itself remained, as before, the legally recognized form, the official cloak of prostitution, and moreover, was supplemented by rich crops of adultery. In a word, compared with the splendid promises of the philosophers, the social and political institutions born of the triumph of reason were, bitterly, were bitter, disappointing caricatures. All that was wanting was the men to formulate this disappointment, and they came with the turn of the century. In 1802, St. Simon's Geneva letters appeared, in 1808 appeared Fourier's first work, although the groundwork of his theory dated from 1799, and on January 1st, 1800, Robert Owen undertook the direction of New Lanark. At this time, however, the capitalist mode of production, and with it the antagonism between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, was still very incompletely developed. Modern industry, which had just arisen in England, was still unknown in France. 
But modern industry develops, on the one hand, the conflicts which makes absolutely necessary a revolution in the mode of production, and the doing away with its capitalistic character. This conflicts not only between the classes begotten of it, but also between the very productive forces and the forms of exchange created by it. And, on the other hand, it develops, in these very gigantic productive forces, the means of ending these conflicts. If, therefore, about the year 1800, the conflicts arising from the new social order were just beginning to take shape, this holds still more fully as to the means of ending them. The have-nothing masses of Paris during the Reign of Terror were able for a moment to gain the mastery, and thus to lead the bourgeois revolution to victory in spite of the bourgeoisie themselves. But, in doing so, they only proved how impossible it was for their domination to last under the conditions then obtaining. The proletariat, which then was the first time evolved itself from the have-nothing masses as the nucleus of a new class, as yet quite incapable of independent political action, still appeared as an oppressed, suffering order to whom, in its capacity to help itself, help could, at best, be brought in from without or down from above. This historical situation also dominated the founders of socialism. To the crude conditions of capitalistic production and the crude class conditions corresponding crude theories. The solution of the social problems, which had yet lay hidden in the undeveloped economic conditions, the utopians attempted to evolve out of the human brain. Society represented nothing but wrongs. To remove these was the task of reason. It was necessary then to discover a new and more perfect system of social order and to impose this upon society from without by propaganda, and wherever it was possible, by the example of model experiments. These new social systems were foredoomed as utopian. The more completely they were worked out in detail, the more they could not avoid drifting off into pure fantasies. The facts once established, we need not dwell a moment longer upon the side of the question, now wholly belonging to the past. We can leave it to the literary small fry to solemnly quibble over these fantasies, which today only make us smile, and to crow over the superiority of their old bald reasoning, as compared with such insanity. For ourselves we delight in the stupendously grand thoughts and germs of thought that everywhere break out through their fantastic covering, and to which these Philistines are blind. saint Simon was the son of the great French Revolution at the outbreak of which he was not yet thirty. The revolution was the victory of the third estate, i.e. of the great masses of the nation, working in production and in trade over the privileged idle classes, the nobles and the priests. But the victory of the third estate soon revealed itself as exclusively the victory of a small part of this estate as the conquest of political power by the socially privileged section of it. For example, the property bourgeoisie and the bourgeoisie had certainly developed rapidly during the revolution, partly by speculation in the lands of the nobility and of the church, confiscated and afterwards put up for sale, and partly by frauds upon the nation by means of army contracts. It was the domination of these swindlers that, under the directorate, brought France to the verge of ruin, and thus gave Napoleon the pretext for his coup d'etat. Hence, to Saint-Simon, the antagonism between the third estate and the privileged classes took the form of an antagonism between workers and idlers. The idlers were not merely the old privileged classes, but also all who, without taking any part in production or distribution, lived on their incomes. And the workers were not only the wage workers, but also the manufacturers, the merchants, and bankers. That these idlers had lost the capacity for intellectual leadership and political supremacy had been proved and was by the revolution finally settled. That the non-possessing classes had not this capacity seen to St. Simone proved by the experience of the reign of terror. Then, who is to lead and command? According to St. Simone, science and industry, both united by a new religious bond, destined to restore that unity of religious ideas which had been lost since the time of the Reformation. Unnecessarily mystic and rigidly hierarchic new Christianity. But science, that was the scholars, and industry, that was, in the first place, the working bourgeois, manufacturers, merchants, and bankers, 
These bourgeois were, certainly, intended by St. Simon to transfer themselves into a kind of public official, of social trustees, but they were to still hold, vis-à-vis -vis of the workers, a commanding and econ economically privileged position. The bankers especially were to be called upon to direct the whole of social production by the regulation of credit. This conception was, in exact keeping with time and with modern industry in France, and with it the chasm between bourgeoisie and proletariat, was only just coming into existence. But what St. Simon especially lays rest upon is this. What interests him first, and above all other things, is a lot of the class that is the most numerous and the most poor. La classe la plus nombreuse et la plus pauvre. Already in his Geneva letters, St. Simon lays down the proposition that all men ought to work. In the same work, he recognizes that the reign of terror was the reign of the non-possessing masses. See, he says to them, what happened in France at the time when your comrades held sway there? They brought out a famine. But to recognize the French Revolution as a class war, not simply one between nobility and bourgeoisie, but between nobility, bourgeoisie, and the non-possessors, was in the year 1802 a more, most pregnant discovery. In 1816, he declares that politics is the science of production and foretells the complete absorption of politics by economics. The knowledge of that economic conditions are the basis of political institution appears here only in embryo. Yet what is here already very painly expressed is the idea of the future conversation of the political rule over men into an administration of things and a direction of process of production. That is to say, the abolition of the state, about which recently there has been so much noise. St. Simon shows the same superiority over his contemporaries, when in 1814, immediately after the entry of the Allies into Paris, and again in 1815 during the Hundred Day War, he proclaims the alliance of France with England, and then of both of these countries with Germany, as the only guarantee for the prosperous development of peace in Europe. To preach to the French in 1815 an alliance with the victors of Waterloo required as much courage as historical foresight. If in St. Simon we find a comprehensive breadth of view, by virtue of which almost all the ideas of later socialists that are not strictly economic are found in embryo, we find in Fouillet a, a criticism of existing conditions of society, genuinely French and witty, but not upon that account any less thorough. Fouillet takes the bourgeoisie, their inspired prophets before the revolution, and their interested eulogists after it, at their word. He lays bare remorselessly the material and moral misery of the bourgeois world. He confronts it with the earlier philosopher's dazzling promises of a society in which reason alone should reign, of a civilization in which happiness should be universal, of an illimitable human perfectibility, and with it the rose-colored phraseology of the bourgeois ideologist of his time. He points out how everywhere the most pitiful reality corresponds with the most high-sounding phrases, and he overwhelms this hopeless fiasco of phrases with his mordant sarcasm. Fouillet is not only a critic. His imperturbably serene nature makes him a satirist, and assuredly one of the greatest satirists of all time. He depicts with equal power and charm the swindling speculations that blossomed upon the downfall of the revolution, and the shopkeeping spirit prevalent in, and the characteristic of, French commerce at the time. Still more masterly is his criticism of the bourgeois form of the relations between the sexes and the position of women in bourgeois society. He was the first to declare that any given social society, the degree of women's emancipation is the natural measure of general emancipation. But Fouillet is at his greatest in his conception of the history of society. He defies its whole course thus far into four stages of evolution, savagery, barbarism, the Patricate, and Civilization. The last is identical with the so-called civil or bourgeois society of today. For example, with the social order that came in with the 16th century. He proves that, quote, the civilized stage rises in every practice by barbarism in a simple fashion into a form of existence, complex, ambiguous, equivocal, hypocritical. 
that civilization moves in a vicious circle, in contradictions which it constantly reproduces without being able to solve. Hence, it constantly arrives at the very opposite to which it wants to attain, or pretends to want to attain. So that, example, under civilization, poverty is born of superabundance itself. Foyer, as we have seen, uses the dialectical method in the same master way as his contemporary Hegel. Using, the, using these same dialectics, he argues against the talk about illimitable human perfectibility, that every historical phrase has its period of ascent and also its period of descent, and he applies this observation to the future of the whole human race. As Kant introduced into natural sciences the idea of the ultimate destruction of Earth, Fourier introduced into historical science that of the ultimate destruction of the human race. Whilst in France, the hurricane of the revolution swept over the land, in England, a quieter but not on that account less tremendous revolution was going on. Steam and the new tool-making machinery were transforming manufacture into modern industry, and thus revolutionizing the whole foundations of bourgeois society. The sluggish march of development of the manufacturing period changed into the veritable storm and stress period of production. With constantly increasing swiftness and splitting up of society into large capitalist and non-possessing proletarians continued on. Between these, instead of the former stable middle class, an unstable mass of population now led a precarious existence. The new mode of production was, as yet, only at the beginning of its period of ascent. As yet, it was the normal, regular method of production, the only one possible under existing conditions. Nevertheless, even then it was producing crying social abuses, the herding together of a homeless population in the worst quarters of large towns, the loosening of all traditional moral bonds, a patriarchal subordination of family relations, overwork, especially of women and children, to a frightful extent, complete demoralization of the working class suddenly flung all together into new conditions from the country into the town, from agriculture into modern industry, from stable conditions of existence into insecure ones that changed from day to day. At this juncture there came forward a reformer, a manufacturer 29 years old, a man of almost sublime, childlike simplicity of character, and at the same place, one of the few-born leaders of men. Robert Owen had adopted the teaching of the materialistic philosophers, that man's character is the product, on the one hand, of heredity, on the other, of the environment of the individual during his lifetime, and especially during his period of development. In the Industrial Revolution, most of his class saw only chaos and confusion, and the opportunity of fishing in these troubled waters and making large fortunes quickly. He saw in it the opportunity of putting into practice his favorite theory, and so of bringing order out of chaos, and he already tried it with success as superintendent of more than 500 men in a Manchester factory. From 1800 to 1829, he directed the great cotton mill at New Lanark in Scotland, as a managing partner along the same lines, but with greater freedom of action and with the success that made him a European reputation. A population originally consisting of the most diverse and, for the most part, very demoralized elements, a population that gradually grew to 2,500, he turned into a model colony, in which drunkenness, police, magistrates, lawsuits, poor laws, charity, were all unknown. And all this simply by placing people in conditions worthy of human beings, and especially by carefully bringing up the rising generation. He was the founder of infant schools and introduced them first at Lanark. At the age of two, the children came to school, where they enjoyed themselves so much that they could scarcely be got home again. Whilst his competitors worked their people 13 or 14 hours a day, in New Lanark the working day was only 10 and a half hours. When a crisis in cotton stopped work for four months, his workers received their full wages at the time. And, with all this business, more than doubled in value, and the last yielded large profits for its proprietors. In spite of all this, Owen was not content. The existence which he secured for his workers was, in his eyes, still far from being worthy of human beings. Quote, the people were slaves at my mercy. The relatively favorable conditions in which he had placed them 
were still far from allowing a rational development of the character and of the intellect in all directions, much less of the free exercise of all of their faculties. Quote, and yet, the working part of this population of 2,500 persons was daily producing as much real wealth for society as, less than half a century before, it would have required the working of a population of 600,000 to create. I asked myself, what became of the difference between the wealth consumed by 2,500 persons and that which would have been consumed by 600,000? The answer was clear. It had been used to pay the proprietors of the establishment 5% of the capital they had laid out, and in addition to over 300,000 pounds clear profit. And that which held for new Lanark held still greater extent for the factories in England. If this new wealth had not been created by machinery, imperfectly as it had been applied, the wars of Europe in opposition to Napoleon and to support the aristocratic principles of society could not have been maintained. And yet this new power was the creation of the working class. To them, therefore, the fruits of this new power belonged, and the newly created gigantic productive forces hitherto used only to enrich individuals and to enslave the masses offered to Owen the foundations for a reconstruction of society. They were destined, as the common property of all, to be worked for the common good of all. Owen's communism was based upon this purely business foundation, the outcome, so to say, of commercial calculation. Throughout, it maintained this practical character. Thus, in 1823, Owen proposed the relief of the distress in Ireland by communist colonies, and drew up complete estimates of costs of founding them, yearly expenditure, and probable revenue. And in this definite plan for the future, the technical working out of details is managed with such practical knowledge, ground plan, front and side and bird's eye views all included, that the Owen method of social reform once accepted, there is a form of practical point of view little to be said against the actual arrangements of details. His advance in the direction of communism was the turning point in Owen's life. As long as he was simply a thorough anthropist, he was rewarded with nothing but wealth, applause, honor, and glory. He was the most popular man in Europe. Not only men of his own class, but statesmen and princes listened to him approvingly. But when he came out with his communist theories, that was quite another thing. Three great obstacles seemed to him especially to block the path of social reform private property, religion, and the present form of marriage. He knew what confronted him if he attacked these. Outlawry, excommunication from official society, the loss of his whole social position. But nothing of this prevented him from attacking them without fear of consequences. And what he had foreseen happened. Banished from official society with a conspiracy of silence against him in the press, Ruined by his unsuccessful communist experiments in America, in which he sacrificed all his fortune, he turned directly to the working class and continued working in their midst for 30 years. Every social movement, every real advance in England on behalf of the workers links itself on the name of Robert Owen. He forced through in 1819 after five years fighting the first law limiting the hours of labor of women and children in factories. He was president of the first Congress at which all the trade unions of England united in a single great trade association. He introduced as transition measures to the complete communist reorganization of society, on the one hand, cooperative societies for retail trade and production. These have since, at the time at least, given practical proof that the merchant and the manufacturer are socially quite unnecessary. On the other hand, he introduced labor bazaars for the exchange of the products of labor through the medium of labor notes, whose unit was a single hour of work. Institutions necessarily doomed to failure, but completely anticipating Proudhon's bank of exchange of a much later period, and differing entirely from this and that, it did not claim to be the panacea for all social ills, but only a first step towards a much more radical revolution of society. The utopian's mode of thought was for a long time governed the socialist ideas of the 19th century, and still governs some of them. Until very recently, all French and English socialists did homage to it. The earlier German communism, including that of Weitling, was of the same school. To all these, socialism is the expression of an absolute truth, reason, and justice, 
and has only to be discovered to conquer all the world by virtue of its own power. And as an absolute truth, it's independent of time, space, and of the historical development of man. It is a mere accident when and where it was discovered. With all this, absolute truth, reason, and justice are different with the founder of each different school. And as each one's special kind of absolute truth, reason, and justice is again conditioned by his subjective understanding, his conditions of existence, the measure of his knowledge and of his intellectual training, there is no other ending possible in this conflict of absolute truths than that they shall be mutually exclusive of one another. Hence, from this nothing could come but a kind of eclectic average socialism, which as a matter of fact has up to the present time dominated the minds of most of the socialist workers of France and England. Hence, a mishmash allowing of the most manifold shades of opinion, a mishmash of so such critical statements, economic theories, pictures of future society by the founders of different sects, as excite a minimum of opposition. A mishmash which is the more easily brewed, the more the definite sharp edges of the individual constituents are rubbed down in the stream of debate, like rounded pebbles in a brook. To make a science of socialism, it had to be first place upon a real basis. Part 2 In the meantime, along with and after the French philosophy of the 18th century, had arisen the new German philosophy culminating in Hegel. Its greatest merit was the taking up again of dialectics as the highest form of reasoning. The old Greek philosophers were all born natural dialecticians, and Aristotle, the most encyclopedic intellect of them, had already analyzed the most essential forms of dialectic thought. The newer philosophy, on the other hand, although in it also dialectics, had brilliant exponents, Descartes, Spinoza, had especially through the English influence, become more and more rigidly fixed in the so-called metaphysical mode of reasoning, by which also the French of the 18th century were almost wholly dominated, at all events in their special philosophical work. Outside philosophy in the restricted sense, the French nevertheless produced masterpieces of dialectics. We need only call to mind Diderot's Le Nouveau de Romeu, and Rousseau's Discours sur l'origine de la fondement we give here in brief the essential character of these two modes of thought. When we consider and reflect upon nature at large, or the history of mankind, or our own intellectual activity, at first we see the picture of an endless entanglement of relations and reactions, permutations and combinations, in which nothing remains what, where, and as it was, but everything moves, changes, comes into being, and passes away. We see, therefore, at first the picture as a whole, with its individual parts still more or less kept in the background. We observe the movements, transitions, connections, rather than the things that move, combine, and are connected. This primitive, naive, but intrinsically correct conception of the world is that of ancient Greek philosophy, and was first clearly formulated by Heraclitus. Everything is and is not, for everything is fluid, is constantly changing, constantly coming into being, and passing away. But this conception, correctly as it expresses the general character of the picture of the appearances as a whole, does not suffice to explain the details of which this picture is made up, and so long as we do not understand these, we have not a clear idea of the whole picture. In order to understand these details, we must detach them from their natural or historical connection and examine each one separately, its nature, special causes, effects, etc. This is, primarily, the task of the natural science and of historical research, branches of science which the Greeks of classical times on every good grounds regulated to subordinate position because they had first of all to collect materials for these sciences to work upon. A certain amount of natural and historical material must be collected before there can be any critical analysis, comparison, and arrangement in classes, orders, and species. The foundations of the exact natural sciences were, therefore, first worked out by the Greeks of the Alexandrian period, and later on in the Middle Ages by the Arabs. Real natural science dates from the second half of the 15th century, and thence onwards it has advanced with constantly increasing rapidity. The analysis of nature into its individual parts, the grouping of the different natural processes and objects in definite classes, 
the study of the internal anatomy of organic bodies in their manifold forms. These were the fundamental conditions of the gigantic strides in our knowledge of nature that have been made during the last 400 years. But this method of work has also left us a legacy of the habit of observing natural objects and processes in isolation, apart from their connection with the vast whole, of observing them in repose, not in motion, as constants, not essential variables, in their death, not in their life. And when this way of looking at things was transferred by Bacon and Locke from natural science to philosophy, it begot the narrow metaphysical mode of thought particular to the last century. To the metaphysician, things and their mental reflexes, ideas, are isolated. They're to be considered one after the other and apart from each other. They're objects of investigation, fixed, rigid, given once and for all. He thinks in absolutely irreconcilable antitheses. His communication is, yeah, yeah, nay, nay, for whatever is so more than these cometh of evil. For him a thing neither exists nor does not exist. A thing cannot at the same time be itself and something else. Positive and negative absolutely exclude one another. Cause and effect stand in rigid antithesis one to the other. At first sight, this mode of thinking seems to us very luminous because it is that of so-called sound common sense. Only sound common sense, respectable fellow that he is, in the homely realm of his own four walls, has very wonderful adventures directly he ventures out into the wide world of research. And the metaphysical mode of thought, justifiable and necessary as it is in a number of domains whose extent, whose extent varies accordingly to the nature of the particular object of investigation, sooner or later reaches a limit, beyond which it becomes one-sided, restricted, abstract, lost in insoluble contradictions. In the contemplation of individual things, it forgets the connection between them. In the contemplation of their existence, it forgets the beginning and the end of that existence, of their repose. It forgets their motion. It cannot see the wood for the trees. For everyday purposes, we know and can say, for example, whether an animal is alive or not. But upon closer inquiry, we find that it is, in many cases, a very complex question, as the jurists know very well. They have cajoled their brains in vain to discover a rational limit beyond which the killing of the child in its mother's womb is murder. And it is just as impossible to determine absolutely the moment of death, for physiology proves that death is not an instantaneous momentary phenomenon, but a very protracted process. In like manner, every organic being is in every moment the same and not the same. Every moment it assimilates matter supplied from without and gets rid of other matter. Every moment some cells of its body die and others build themselves anew. In a longer or shorter time, the matter of its body is completely renewed and it's replaced by other molecules of matter so that every organic being is always itself and yet something other than itself. Further, we find upon closer investigation that the two poles of an antithesis, positive and negative, are as inseparable as they are opposed, and that despite all their opposition, they mutually interpenetrate. And we find, in like manner, that cause and effect are conceptions which only hold good in their application to individual cases. But as soon as we consider the individual cases in their general connection with the universe as a whole, they run into each other, and they become confounded when we contemplate that universal action and reaction in which causes and effect are eternally changing places, so that what is effect here and now will be caused there and then, and vice versa. None of these processes and modes of thought enters into the framework of metaphysical reasoning. Dialectics, on the other hand, comprehends things in their representation, ideas in their essential connection, concatenation, motion, origin, and ending. Such processes, as those mentioned above, are therefore so many corroborations of its own method of procedure. Nature is the proof of dialectics, and it must be said for modern science that it has furnished this proof with very rich materials increasing daily, and thus has shown that, in the last resort, Nature works dialectically and not metaphysically. That she does not move in the eternal oneness of a perpetually recurring circle, but goes through a real historical evolution. 
In this connection, Darwin must be named before all others. He dealt the metaphysical conception of nature the heaviest blow by his proof that all organic beings, plants, animals, and man himself, are the products of a process of evolution going on through millions of years. But the naturalists who have learned to think dialectically are few and far between, and this conflict of the results of discovery with preconceived modes of thinking explains the endless confusion now reigning in theoretical natural science, the despair of teachers as well as learners, of authors and readers alike. An exact representation of the universe, of its evolution, of the development of mankind, and of the reflection of this evolution in the minds of men can therefore only be obtained by the method of dialectics with its constant regard to the innumerable actions and reactions of life and death, of progressive or retrogressive changes. And in this spirit, the new German philosophy has worked. Kant began his career by resolving the stable solar system of Newton and its eternal duration, after the famous initial impulse that had once been given, into the result of a historic process, the formation of the sun and all the planets out of a rotating nebulous mass. From this, he at the same time drew the conclusion that, given this origin of the solar system, its future death followed of necessity. His theory, half a century later, was established mathematically by Laplace. But half a century after that spectroscope proved the existence in space of such incandescent masses of gas in various stages of condensation. This new German philosophy culminated in the Hegelian system. In this system, and herein in its great merit, for the first time the whole world, natural, historical, intellectual, is represented as a, as a process, as in constant motion, change, transformation, development, and the attempt is made to trace out the internal connection that makes a continuous whole of all this movement and development. From this point of view, the history of mankind no longer appeared at a wild whirl of senseless deeds and violence, all equally condemnable at the judgment seat of the mature philosophical reason, and which are at best forgotten as quickly as possible, but rather as the process of evolution of man himself. It was now the task of the intellect to follow the gradual march of this process through all its deviant ways and to trace out the inner law running through all its apparently accidental phenomena. That the Hegelian system did not solve the problem it propounded is here immaterial. Its epoch-making merit was that it propounded the problem. This problem is one that no single individual will ever be able to solve, although Hegel was, with saint Simon, the most encyclopedic mind of his time. Yet he was limited, first, by the necessarily limited extent of his own knowledge, and second, by the limited extent and depth of the knowledge and conceptions of his age. To these limits, a third must be added. Hegel was an idealist. To him, the thoughts within his brain were not the more or less abstract pictures of actual things and processes, but conversely, things in their evolution were only the realized pictures of the, quote, idea existing somewhere from eternity before the world was. This way of thinking turned everything upside down and completely reversed the actual connection of things in the world. Correctly and ingeniously, as many individual groups of facts were grasped by Hegel, yet, for the reasons just given, there is much that is botched, artificial, labored, in a word, wrong, in point of detail. The Hegelian system in itself was a colossal miscarriage, but it was also the last of its kind. It was suffering, in fact, from an internal and incurable contradiction. Upon the one hand, its essential proposition was the conception that human history is a process of evolution, which by its very nature cannot find its intellectual final term in the discovery of any so-called absolute truth. But on the other hand, it laid claim to being the very essence of this absolute truth. A system of natural and historical knowledge embracing everything and final for its time is a contradiction to the fundamental law of dialectic reasoning. This law, indeed, by no means excludes, but on the contrary includes the idea that the systematic knowledge of the external universe can make giant strides from age to age. The perception of the fundamental contradiction in German idealism led necessarily back to materialism. But, nota bene, not to the simple metaphysical, exclusively mechanical materialism of the 18th century, Old materialism looked upon all previous history as a crude heap of irrationality and violence. Modern materialism sees it the process of evolution of humanity, 
and aims at discovering those laws thereof. With the French of the 18th century, and even with Hegel, the conception obtained of nature as a whole, moving in narrow circles and forever immutable, with its eternal celestial bodies as Newton, and unalterable organic species as Leonidas might have taught. Modern materialism embraces the more recent discoveries of natural science, according to which nature also has history and time. The celestial bodies, like the organic species that, under favorable conditions, people, them, being born and perishing. And even if nature as a whole must still be said to move in recurrent cycles, these cycles assume infinitely larger dimensions. In both aspects, modern materialism is essentially dialectic, and no longer requires the assistance of that sort of philosophy which, queen-like, pretended to rule the remaining mob of sciences. As soon as each special science is bound to make clear its position in the great totality of things and for our knowledge of things, a special science dealing with the totality is superfluous and unnecessary. That which still survives of all her earlier philosophy is the science of thought and its laws, formal logic and dialectics. Everything else is subsumed in the positive science of nature and history. Whilst, however, the revolution in the conception of nature could only be made in proportion to the corresponding positive materials furnished by research, already much earlier certain historical facts had occurred which led to decisive change in the conception of history. In 1831, the first working class rising took place in Lyon. Between 1838 and 1842, the first national working class movement, that of the English Chartists, reached its height. The class struggle between proletariat and bourgeoisie came to the front in the history of the most advanced countries in Europe. In proportion to the development, upon the one hand of modern industry, and upon the other of the newly acquired political supremacy of the bourgeoisie. Facts more and more strenuously gave the lie to the teachings of the bourgeois economy as to the identity of interests of capital and labor, as to the universal harmony and universal prosperity that would be the consequences of unbridled competition. All these things could no longer be ignored, any more than the French and English socialism, which was their theoretical, though very imperfect, expression. But the old idealist's conception of history, which was not yet dislodged, knew nothing of the class struggles based upon economic interests, knew nothing of economic interests. Production and all economic relations appeared in it only as incidental, subordinate elements in the, quote, history of civilization. The new facts made imperative a new examination of all past history. Then it was seen that all past history, with the exception of its primitive stages, was the history of class struggles. That all these warring classes of society are always in the products of the modes of production and of exchange. In a word, of the economic conditions of their time. That the economic structure of society always furnishes the real basis starting from which we can alone work out the ultimate explanation of the whole superstructure of juridical and political institutions, as well as the religious, philosophical, and other ideas of a given historical period. Hegel had freed history from metaphysics. He had made it dialectic, but his conception of history was still essentially idealistic. But now idealism was driven from its last refuge, the philosophy of history. Now a materialistic treatment of history was propounded, and a method fond of explaining man's knowing by his being, instead of, as heretofore, his being by his knowing. From that time forward, socialism was no longer an accidental discovery of this or that ingenious brain, but the necessary outcome of the struggle between two historically developed classes, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Its task was no longer to manufacture a system of society as perfect as possible, but to examine the historical co-economic succession of events from which these classes and their antagonism had of necessity sprung, and to discover in the economic conditions thus created the means of ending the conflict. But the socialism of earlier days was as incompatible with this materialist conception of history as the conception of nature from the French materialists as with the dialectics of modern natural science. The socialism of earlier days certainly criticized the existing capitalistic mode of production and its consequences, but it couldn't explain them, and therefore it could not get the mastery of them. It could only simply reject them as bad, 
The more strong this earlier socialism denounced the exploitation of the working class, inevitable under capitalism, the less able it was to clearly show in what this exploitation consisted and how it arose. But for this it was necessary, one, to present the capitalistic method of production in its historical connection and its inevitableness during a particular historical period, and therefore also to present its inevitable downfall, and two, to lay bare its essential character, which was still a secret. This was done by the discovery of surplus value. It was shown that the appropriation of unpaid labor is the basis of the capitalist mode of production and of the exploitation of the worker that occurs under it. That even if the capitalist buys the labor power of his laborer at its full value as a commodity on the market, he yet extracts more value from it than he paid it for. And that in the ultimate analysis, this surplus value forms those sums of value from which are heaped the constantly increasing masses of capital in the hands of the possessing classes. The genesis of capitalist production and the production of capital were both explained. These two great discoveries, the materialistic conception of history and the revelation of the secret of capitalist production through surplus value, we owe to Marx. With these discoveries, socialism became a science. The next thing to do was work out all its details and relations. Part 3 the materialist conception of history starts from the proposition that the production of the means to support human life and, next to production, the exchange of things produced, is the basis of all social structure. That in every society that has appeared in history, the manner in which wealth is distributed and society divided into classes or orders is dependent upon what is produced, how it is produced, and how the products are exchanged. From this point of view, the final causes of all social changes and political revolutions are to be sought not in men's brains, not in men's better insight into eternal truth and justice, but in changes in the modes of production and exchange. They are to be sought not in the philosophy, but in the economics of each particular epoch. The growing perception that the existing social institutions are unreasonable and unjust, that reason has become unreason and right wrong, is only proof that in the modes of production and exchange, changes have silently taken place with which the social order adapted to earlier economic conditions is no longer in keeping. From this, it also follows that the means of getting rid of the incongruities that have been brought to light must also be present in a more or less developed condition within the changed mode of production themselves. These means are not to be invented by deduction from fundamental principles but are to be discovered in the stubborn facts of the existing system of production. What is, then, the position of modern socialism in this connection? The present structure of society, this is now pretty generally conceded, is the creation of the ruling class of today, of the bourgeoisie. The mode of production peculiar to the bourgeoisie, known since Marx as the capitalist mode of production, was incompatible with the feudal system, with the privileges it conferred upon individuals, entire social ranks, and local corporations, as well as with the hereditary ties of subordination which constituted the framework of its social organization. The bourgeoisie broke up the feudal system and built upon its ruins the capitalist order of society, the kingdom of free competition, of personal liberty, of the equality before the law, of all commodity owners, of all the rest of capitalist blessings. Thenceforward, the capitalist mode of production could develop in freedom. Since steam, machinery, and the making of machines by machinery transformed the older manufacturer into modern industry, the productive forces evolved under the guidance of the bourgeoisie developed with a rapidity and in a degree unheard of before. But just as the older manufacturer in its time and handicraft becoming more developed under its influence had come into collision with the feudal trammels of the guilds, so now modern industry, with its more complete development, comes into collusion with the bounds with which the capitalistic mode of production holds to be confined. The new productive forces have already outgrown the capitalist mode of using them, and this conflict between productive forces and modes of production is not a conflict engendered in the mind of man, like that between original sin and divine justice. It exists, in fact, objectively outside us, independently of the will and actions, 
even of the men that have brought it on. Modern socialism is nothing but the reflex, in thought, of this conflict in fact. Its ideal reflection in the minds, first, of the class directly suffering under it, the working class. Now, in what does this conflict consist? Before capitalistic production, so in the Middle Ages, the system of petty industry obtained generally based upon the private property of the laborers in their means of production. In the country, the agriculture of the small peasant, freemen or serf, in the towns, the handicrafts organized into guilds. The instruments of labor, land, agricultural implements, the workshop, the tool, were the imp impl instruments of labor of a single individual, adapted for the use of one worker, and therefore, of necessity, small, dwarfish, circumscribed. But for this very reason, they belonged, as a rule, to the producer himself. To concentrate these scattered, limited means of production, to enlarge them, to turn them into powerful levers of production of the present day, this was precisely the historic role of the capitalist production and of its upholder, the bourgeoisie. In the fourth section of Capital, Marx has explained in detail how since the 15th century, this has been historically worked out through three phases of simple cooperation, manufacture, and modern industry. But the bourgeoisie, as it is shown there, could not transform these puny means of production into mighty productive forces without transforming them, at the same time, from means of production of the individual into social means of production, only workable by a collectivity of men. The spinning wheel, the hand loom, the blacksmith's hammer were replaced by the spinning machine, the power loom, and the steam hammer. The individual workshop by the factory implying the cooperation of hundreds or thousands of workmen. In like manner, production itself changed from a series of individual into a series of social acts, and the products from individual to social products. The yarn, the cloth, the metal articles that now come out of the factory were the joint product of many workers, through whose hands they had successively passed before they were to be ready. No one person could say of them, I made that. This is my product. But where, in a given society, the fundamental form of production is that spontaneous division of labor which creeps in gradually and not upon any preconceived plans, there the products take on the form of commodities, whose mutual exchange, buying and selling, enable the individual producers to satisfy their manifold wants. And this was the case in the Middle Ages. The peasant, i.e. sold to the artisan agricultural products and bought from him the products of handicraft. Into this society of individual producers, the commodity producers, the new mode of production thrust itself. In the midst of the old division of labor, grown up spontaneously and upon no definite plan, which had governed the whole of society, now arose division of labor based upon a definite plan, as organized in the factory. Side by side with individual production appeared social production. The products of both were sold on the same market, and therefore at prices at least comparatively equal. But the organization upon a definite plan was stronger than spontaneous division of labor. The factories working with the combined social forces of a collectivity of individuals produced their commodities far more cheaply than did individual small producers. Individual production succumbed in one department after another. Socialized production revolutionized all the old methods of production, but its revolutionary character was, at the same time, so little recognized that it was, on the contrary, introduced as a means of increasing and developing the production of commodities. When it arose, it found ready-made and made liberal use of certain machinery for the production and exchange of commodities. Merchants' capital, handicraft, wage labor. Socialized production thus introducing itself as a new form of the production of commodities, it was a matter of course that under it the old forms of appropriation remained in full swing and were applied to its products as well. In the medieval stage of evolution of the production of commodities, the question as to the owner of the product of labor could not arise. The individual producer as a rule had, from raw material belonging to himself and generally his own handiwork, produced it with his own tools by the labor of his own hands or of his family. There was no need for him to appropriate the new product. It belonged wholly to him as a matter of course. His property in the product was, therefore, based upon his own labor. Even where external help was used, this was, as a rule, of little importance, 
and very generally was compensated by something other than wages. The apprentices and journeymen of the guilds worked less for board and wage than did for, they did for education, in order that they might become master craftsmen themselves. Then came the concentration of the means of production and for the producers in large workshops and manufactories, their transformation into actual socialized means of production and the socialized producers. From the socialized producers and the means of production, their products were still treated after this change just as they had been before, i.e. as the means of production and the products of individuals. Hitherto, the owner of the instruments of labor had himself appropriated the product because, as a rule, it was his own product, and the assistance of others was the exception. Now the owner of in the instruments of labor always appropriated to himself the product, though it was no longer his product, but exclusively the product of the labor of other people. Thus, the products now produced socially were not appropriated by those who had actually set in motion the means of production and had actually produced the commodities, but by the capitalists. The means of production and the production itself had become in, ens in essence socialized, but they were subjected to a form of appropriation which presupposes the private production of individuals, under which, therefore, everyone owns his own product and brings it to market. The mode of production is subjected to this form of appropriation, although it abolishes the condition upon which the latter rests. This contradiction, which gives to the new mode of production its capitalistic character, contains the germ of the whole social antagonisms of today. The greater of the mastery obtained by the new mode of production over all important fields of production and in all manufacturing countries, the more it reduced individual production to an insignificant residuum, the more clearly was brought out by the incompatibility of socialized production with capitalistic appropriation. The first capitalists found, as we have seen, alongside other forms of labor, wage labor ready-made for them on the market. But it was exceptional, complementary, accessory, transitionary wage labor. The agricultural laborer, though upon occasion he hired himself out for the day, had a few acres of his own land on which he could at all events live in a pinch. But the guilds were so organized that the journeymen of today became the master of tomorrow. But all this changed as soon as the means of production became socialized and concentrated in the hands of capitalists. The means of production, as well as the product of the individual producer, became more and more worthless. There was nothing left for him but to turn wage worker under the capitalist. Wage labor, aforetime the exception and accessory, now became as a rule and basis of all production. Aforetime complementary, it now became the sole remaining function of the workers. The wage worker for a time became a wage worker for life. The number of these permanent wage workers was further enormously increased by the breaking up of the feudal system that occurred at the same time, by the disbanding of the retainers of the feudal lords, the eviction of the peasants from their homesteads, etc. The separation was made complete when the means of production concentrated in the hands of the capitalists on the one side and the producers possessing nothing but their labor power on the other. The contradiction between the socialized production and capitalistic appropriation manifested itself as the antagonism of proletariat and bourgeoisie. We've seen that the capitalistic mode of production thrust its way into the society of commodity producers, of individual producers, whose social bond was the exchange of their products. But every society based upon the production of commodities has this particularity, that the producers have lost control over their own social relations. Each man produces for himself with such means of production as he may happen to have, and for such exchange as he may require to satisfy his remaining wants. No one knows how much of this particular article is coming on the market, nor how much of it will be wanted. No one knows whether his individual product will meet an actual demand, whether he will be able to make good his cost of production, or even sell his commodity at all. Anarchy reigns in socialized production. But the production of commodities, like every form of production, has its particular inherent laws inseparable from it. And these laws work, despite anarchy, in and through anarchy. They reveal themselves in the only persistent form of social interrelations, i.e. in exchange. And here they affect the individual producers as compulsory laws of competition. They are, at first, unknown to these producers themselves, 
and have to be discovered by them gradually and as the result of experience. They work themselves out, therefore, independently of the producers and in antagonism to them, as inexorable natural laws of their particular form of production. The product governs the producers. In medieval society, especially in the earlier centuries, production was essentially directed towards satisfying the wants of the individual. It satisfied, in the main, only the wants of the producer and his family. Where relations of personal dependence existed, as in the country, it also helped to satisfy the wants of the feudal lord. In all this there was, therefore, no exchange. The products, consequently, did not assume the character of commodities. The family of the peasant produced almost everything they wanted, clothes and furniture, as well as the means of subsistence. Only when it began to produce more than it was sufficient to supply its own wants and the payments in kind to the feudal lord, only then did it produce commodities. This surplus, thrown into socialized exchange and offered for sale, became commodities. The artisans of the towns, it is true, had from the first to produce for exchange, but they also themselves supplied the greatest part of their own individual wants. They had gardens and plots of land. They turned their cattle out into the communal forest, which also yielded them timber and firing. The women spun flax, wool, and so forth. Production for the purpose of exchange, production for commodities, was only in its very infancy. Hence, exchange was restricted, the market narrow, the methods of production stable. There was local exclusiveness without, local unity within. The mark in the country, in the town, the guild. But with the extension of production of commodities, and especially with the introduction of the capitalist mode of production, the laws of commodity production, hitherto latent, came into action more openly and with greater force. The old bonds were loosened, the old exclusive limits broken through, the producers were more and more turned into independent, isolated producers of commodities. It became apparent that the production of society at large was ruled by an absence of a plan, by accident, by anarchy, and this anarchy grew at greater and greater heights. But the chief means by aid, and of which the capitalist mode of production intensified this anarchy of socialized production, was the exact opposite of anarchy. It was the increasing organization of production upon a social basis in every individual productive establishment. By this, the old, peaceful, stable condition of things was ended. Wherever this organization of production was introduced into a branch of industry, it brooked no other method of production by its side. The field of labor, labor became a battleground. The great geographical discoveries and the colonization following upon them, the multiplied markets and quickened the transformation of handicraft into manufacture. The war did not simply break out between the individual producers of particular localities. The local struggles begot in turn national conflicts, the commercial wars of the 17th and 18th centuries. Finally, modern industry and the opening of the world market made the struggle universal and at the same time gave it an unheard of virulence. Advantages in natural or artificial conditions of production now decide the existence or non-existence of individual capitalists, as well as of whole industries and countries. He that falls is remorselessly cast aside. It is the Darwinian struggle of the individual for existence transferred from nature to society with intensified violence. The conditions of existence natural to the animal appear as in the final term of human development. The contradiction between the socialized production and capitalistic appropriation now presents itself as an antagonism between the organization of production in the individual workshop and the anarchy of production in society generally. The capitalistic mode of production moves in these two forms of the antagonism imminent to it from its very origin. It is never able to get out of that vicious circle from which Foyer had discovered. What Foyer could not indeed see in his time is that this circle is gradually narrowing, that the movement becomes more and more a spiral and must come to an end, like the movement of the planets, by collision with the center. It is the compelling force of anarchy in the production of society at large that more and more completely turns the great majority of men into proletarians. And it is the masses of the proletariat again who will finally put an end to anarchy in production. It is the compelling force of anarchy in social production that turns the limitless perfectibility of machinery under modern industry into a compulsory law by which every individual industrial capitalist must perfect his machinery more and more under penalty of ruin. <laughs>
but the perfecting of machinery is making human labor superfluous. If the introduction and increase of machinery means the displacement of million of manual of by a few machine workers, improvements in machinery means the displacement of more and more of the machine workers themselves. It means, in the last instance, the production of a number of available wage wor workers in excess of the average needs of capital, the formation of a complete industrial reserve army, as I called it in 1845, available at the times when industry is working at high pressure, to be cast out upon the street when the inevitable crash comes, a constant dead weight upon the limbs of the working class in its struggle for existence with capital, a regulator for the keeping of wages down to the low level that suits the interests of capital. Thus it comes about, to quote Marx, that machinery becomes the most powerful weapon in the war of capital against the working class. That's the instruments of labor constantly tear the means of subsistence out of the hands of the laborer. That the very product of the worker is turned into an instrument for his subjugation. Thus it comes about that the economizing of the instruments of labor becomes, at the same time, from the outset, the most reckless waste of labor power, and the robbery based upon the normal conditions under which labor functions. That machinery, the most powerful instruments for shortening labor time, becomes the most unfailing means for placing every moment of the laborer's time and that of his family at the disposal of the capitalist for the purpose of expanding the value of his capital. Thus it comes about that the overwork of some becomes the preliminary condition for the idleness of others, and that modern industry, which hunts after new consumers over the whole world, forces the consumption of the masses at home down to a starvation minimum, and in doing thus destroys its own home market. The law that always equilibriates the relative surplus population, or industrial reserve army, to the extent and energy of accumulation, this law rivets the laborer to capital more firmly than the wedges of Vulcan did Prometheus to the rock. It establishes an accumulation of misery corresponding with accumulation of capital. Accumulation of wealth at one pole is, therefore, at the same time, accumulation of misery, agony of toil, slavery, ignorance, brutality, mental degradation at the opposite pole, i.e., on the side of the class that produces its own product in the form of capital. And to expect any other division of products from the capitalist mode of production is the same times expecting the electrodes of a battery not to decompose acidulated water, not to liberate oxygen at the positive and hydrogen at the negative pole, so long as they are connected with the battery. We have seen that the ever-increasing perfectibility of modern machinery is, by the anarchy of social production, turned into a compulsory law that forces the individual industrial capitalist always to improve his machinery, always to increase its productive force. The bare possibility of extending the field of production is transformed for him into a similar compulsory law. The enormous expansive force of modern industry compared with which that it gasses is mere child's play, appears to us now as a necessity for expansion, both qualitative and quantitative, that laughs at all resistance. Such resistance is offered by consumption, by sales, by the markets for the products of modern industry. But the capacity for extension, extensive and intensive, of the markets is primarily governed by a quite different laws that work much less energetically. The extension of the markets cannot keep pace with the extension of production. The collision becomes inevitable, and as this cannot produce any real solution so long as it does not break in pieces the capitalist mode of production, the collisions become periodic. Capitalist production has begotten another vicious cycle. As a matter of fact, since 1825, when the first general crisis broke out, the whole industrial and commercial world, production and exchange among all civilized peoples, and their more or less barbaric hangers-on, are thrown out of joint about once every ten years. Commerce is at a standstill. The markets are glutted. Products accumulate. As multidious as they are unsellable. Hard cash disappears. Credit vanishes. Factories are closed. The mass of workers are in want of the means of subsistence because they have produced too much of the means of subsistence. Bankruptcy follows upon bankruptcy, execution upon execution. The stagnant lasts for years. Productive forces and products are wasted and destroyed wholesale until the accumulated mass of commodities finally filters off, more or less depreciated in value, until production and exchange gradually begin to move back again. Little by little, the pace changes. 
It becomes a trot. The individual trot breaks into a canter. The canter in turn grows into a headlong gallop of a perfected spell chase of industry, commercial credit, and speculation which finally, after breakneck leaps, ends where it began, in the ditch of a crisis. And so, over and over again. We have now seen since the year 1825, gone through this five times. And at this present moment, 1877, we are going through it for a sixth time. And the character of these crises is so clearly defined that Fouillet hit on all of them off when he described the first crise plethorique, a crisis from plethora. In these crises, the contradiction between socialized production and capitalistic appropriation ends in a violent explosion. The circulation of commodities is, for the time being, stopped. Money, the means of circulation, becomes a hindrance to circulation. All the laws of production and circulation of commodities are turned upside down. The economic collision has reached its apogee. The mode of production is in rebellion against the mode of exchange. The fact that the socialized organization of production within the factory has developed so far that it has become incompatible with the anarchy of production in society, which exists side by side with it and dominates it, is brought home to the capitalists themselves by the violent concentration of capital that occurs during crises, through the ruin of many large and still greater number of small capitalists. The whole mechanism, the capitalist mode of production itself, breaks down under the pressure of the productive forces, its own creation. It is no longer able to turn all of the mass of means production into capital. They lie follow, and for that very reason the Industrial Reserve Army must also lie follow. Means of production, means of subsistence, available laborers, all the elements of production and of general wealth are present in abundance. But abundance becomes the source of distress and want, because it is the very thing that prevents the transformation of the means of production and subsistence into capital. For in capitalistic society, the means of production can only function when they have undergone a preliminary transformation into capital, into the means of exploiting human labor power. The necessity of this transformation into capital of the means of production and subsistence stands like a ghost between these and the workers. It alone prevents the coming together of the material and personal levers of production. It alone forbids the means of production to function, to the workers to just work and live. On the one hand, therefore, the capitalist mode of production stands convicted of its own incapacity to further direct these productive forces. On the other, These productive forces themselves, with increasing energy, press forward to the removal of existing contradiction, to the abolition of their quality as capital, to the practical recognition of their character as social productive forces. This rebellion of the productive forces as they grow more and more powerful against their quality as capital, this stronger and stronger command that their social character shall be recognized, forces the capitalist class itself to treat them more and more as social productive forces, so far as this is possible under the capitalistic conditions. The period of industrial high pressure, with its unbounded inflation of credit, not less than the crash itself by the collapse of great capitalist establishments, tends to bring about that form of the socialization of great masses of the means of production, which we meet with the different kinds of joint stock companies. Many of these means of production and of distribution are, for the outset, so colossal that, like the railways, they exclude all other forms of capitalistic exploitation. All further stage of evolution of this form becomes insufficient. The producers on a large scale in a particular branch of industry in a particular country unite in a trust, a union, for the purpose of regulating production. They determine the total amount to be produced, parcel in and out amongst themselves, and thus enforce the selling price fixed beforehand. But trusts of this kind, as soon as business becomes bad, are generally liable to break up, and on this very account compel a yet greater concentration of association. The whole of the particular industry is turned into one gigantic joint stock company. Internal competition gives place to the internal monopoly of this one company. This has happened in 1890 with the English alkali production, which is now, after the fusion of 48 large works, in the hand of one company, conducted upon a single plan with the capital of six million pounds. Today we have Amazon. In the trusts, freedom of competition changes into its very opposite, into monopoly, and the production without any definite plan of capitalistic society 
capitulates to the production upon a definite plan of invading socialistic society. Certainly this is far still to the benefit and advantage of the capitalists. But in this case, the exploitation is so palpable that it must break down. No nation will put up with production conducted by trusts. And with so barefaced an exploitation of the community by a small band of dividend mongers. In any case, with trusts or without, the official representation of capitalist society, the state, will ultimately have to undertake the direction of production. This necessity for conversion into state property is felt in the first great institutions of intercourse and communication, the post office, the telegraphs, the railway. If the crisis demonstrate the incapacity for the bourgeoisie for managing any longer modern productive forces, the transformation of the great establishments for production and distribution into joint stock companies, trusts, and state property shows how unnecessary the bourgeoisie are for that purpose. All the social functions of the capitalist are now performed by salaried employees. The capitalist has no further function than that of pocketing dividends, tearing off coupons, and gambling on the stock exchange, where the different capitalists despoil one another of their capital. At first, the capitalistic mode of production forces out the workers. Now it forces out the capitalists, and reduces them, just as it reduced the workers, to the ranks of the surplus population, although not immediately into that industrial reserve army. But the transformation, either into joint stock companies and trusts, or into state ownership, does not do away with the capitalistic nature of the productive forces. In the joint stock companies and the trusts, it, this is obvious. And the modern state, again, is only that organization that bourgeois society takes on in order to support the external conditions of the capitalist mode of production against the encroachments as well of the workers and of individual capitalists. The modern state, no matter what its form, is essentially a capitalist machine, the state of the capitalists, the ideal personification of that total national capital. The more it proceeds to the taking over of productive forces, the more does it actually become the national capitalist, the more citizens does it exploit. The worker remains wage workers, proletarians. The capitalist relationship is not done away with. It is rather brought to a head, and brought to a head, it topples over. State ownership of the productive forces is not the solution of the conflict, but concealed within it are the technical conditions that form the elements of that solution. This solution can only consist in the practical recognition of the social nature of modern forces of production, and therefore in the harmonizing of the modes of production, appropriation, and exchange with the socialized character of the means of production. And this can only come about by the society openly and directly taking possession of the productive forces which have outgrown all except that of the society as a whole. The social character of the means of production and of the products today reacts against the producers, periodically disrupts all production and exchange, acts only like a law of nature working blindly, forcibly, destructively. But with the law taking over by society of the productive forces, the social character of the means of production and of the products will be utilized by the producers with a perfect understanding of its nature. And instead of being a source of disturbance, of periodical collapse, will become the most powerful lever of production itself. Active social forces work exactly like natural forces, blindly, forcibly, destructively, so long as we do not understand and reckon with them. But when once we understand them, when once we grasp their action, their direction, their effects, it depends only upon ourselves to subject more and more of our own will and by means of them to reach our own ends. And this holds quite especially of the mighty productive forces of today. As long as we abstainly refuse to understand the nature and the character of these social means of action, and this understanding goes against the grain of the capitalist mode of production and its defenders, so long these forces are at work in spite of us, in opposition to us, so long they master us, as we should above in detail. But when once their nature is understood, they can, in the hands of the producers working together, be transformed from master demons into willing servants. The difference is that between the destructive force of electricity and the lightning of the storm, and electricity under command in the telegraph and the voltaic arc, the difference between the conflagration and the fire working in the service of man. With this recognition at last of the real nature of the productive forces of today, the social anarchy of production give place to a social regulation of production upon a definite plan. 
according to the needs of the community and of each individual. Then the capitalist mode of appropriation in which the product enslaves first the producer and then the appropriator is replaced by the mode of appropriation of the products that is based upon the nature of the modern means of production. Upon the one hand, direct social appropriation as means to the maintenance and extension of production. On the other, direct individual appropriation as means of subsistence and of enjoyment. Whilst the capitalist mode of production more and more completely transforms the great majority of the population into proletarians, it creates the power which, under penalty of its own destruction, is forced to accomplish this revolution. Whilst it forces on the more and more the transformation of the vast means of production, already socialized, into state property, it shows itself the way to accomplishing this revolution. The proletariat seizes political power and turns the means of production into state property. But in doing this, it abolishes itself as proletariat, abolishes all class distinctions and class antagonisms, abolishes also the state as state. Society thus far, based on class antagonisms, and had need of the state, that is, of an organization of the particular class which was the pro tempoir of the exploiting class, an organization for the purpose of preventing any interference from without of the existing conditions of production, and, therefore, especially, for the purpose of forcibly keeping the exploited classes in the condition of oppression corresponding with the given mode of production, that be slavery, serfdom, or wage labor. The state was the official representative of society as a whole, the gathering of it together in a visible embodiment. But it was this only insofar it was the state of that class which itself represented for the time being, society as a whole. In ancient times, the state of the slave-owning citizen, in the Middle Ages, the feudal lords, and in our time, the bourgeoisie. When at last it becomes the real representative of the whole of society, it renders itself completely unnecessary. As soon as there is no longer any social class to be held in subjection, as soon as class rule, the individual struggle for existence based upon our present anarchy and production, with the collisions and excesses arising from these, are removed, nothing more remains to be repressed, and a special repressive force, a state, is no longer necessary. The first act by virtue of which the state really constitutes itself the representative of the whole of society, this is, at the same time, its last independent act as a state. State interference in social relations becomes, in one domain or another, superfluous, and then dies out of itself. The government of persons is replaced by the administration of things, and the conduct of processes of production. The state is not, quote-unquote, abolished. It dies out. It gives the measure of the value of the phrase, a free state, both as to its justifiable use at times by agitators, and as to its ultimate scientific insufficiency, and also of the demands of the so-called anarchists for the abolition of the state out of hand. Since the historical appearance of the capitalist mode of production, the appropriation by society of all the means of production has often been dreamed of, more or less vaguely, by individuals, as well as by sex, as the ideal for the future. It could become possible. It could become a historical necessity only when the actual conditions for its realization are there. Like every social advance, it becomes practicable not by men understanding that the existence of classes is in contradiction to justice, equality, or whatever, not by the mere willingness to abolish these classes, but by the virtue of a certain new economic condition. The separation of society into an exploiting and exploited class, a ruling and oppressed class, was the necessary consequence of the deficient and restricted development of production in former times. So long as the total social labor only yields a product which but slightly exceeds that barely necessary for the existence of all, so long, therefore, as labor engages all or most all the time with the great majority of the members of society, so long, of necessity, the society is divided into classes. Side by side with the great majority exclusively bond slaves to labor arises a class freed from directly productive labor, which looks after this general affairs of society the direction of labor, state business, law, science, art, etc. It is therefore the law of division of labor that lies at the basis of the division into classes. But this does not prevent this division into classes from being carried out by means of violence and robbery, trickery and fraud. It does not prevent the ruling class, once having the upper hand, from consolidating its power at the expense of the working class, 
from turning its social leadership into an intensified explo exploitation of the masses. But if, upon this showing, division into classes has its certain historical justification, it has this only for a given period, only under given social conditions. It was based upon the insufficiency of production. It will be swept away by the complete development of modern productive forces. And in fact, the abolition of classes in society presupposes a degree of his historical evolution at which the existence, not simply of this or that particular ruling class, but of any ruling class at all, and therefore the existence of class distinctions itself, has become an obsolete anachronism. It presupposes, therefore, the development of production carried out to a degree at which appropriation of the means of production and of the produ products and, with this, of political domination, of the monopoly of culture and of the intellectual leadership by a particular class of society, has not become not only superfluous, but economically, politically, intellectually, a hindrance to development. This point is now reached. Their political and intellectual bankruptcy is scarcely any longer a secret to the bourgeoisie themselves. Their economic bankruptcy recurs regularly every ten years. In every crisis, society is suffocated beneath the weight of its own productive forces and products, which it cannot use. It stands helpless, face to face, with the absurd contradiction that the producers have nothing to consume because consumers are wanting. The expansive force of the means of production burst the bonds that the capitalist mode of production had imposed upon them. Their deliverance from these bonds is the one precondition for an unbroken, constantly accelerated development of the productive forces, and therewith for the practically unlimited increase of production itself. Nor is this all. The socialized appropriation of the means of production does away not only with the present artificial restrictions upon production, but also with the positive waste and devastation of productive forces and products that are at the present time the inevitable concomitants of production and the reach of their height in the crisis. Further, it sets free for the community at large the mass of means of production and of products by doing away with the senseless extravagance of the ruling classes of today and their political representatives. The possibility of securing for every member of society by means of socialized production an existence not only fully sufficient materially, and becoming day by day more full, but an existence guaranteeing to all the free development and exercise of their physical and mental faculties. This possibility is now for the first time here, but it is here. With the seizing of the means of production by society, production of commodities is done away with, and simultaneously the mastery of the product over the producer. Anarchy in social production is replaced by systemic definite organization. The struggle for individual existence disappears. Then, for the first time, man, in a certain sense, is finally marked off from the rest of the animal kingdom and emerges from mere animal conditions of existence into really human ones. The whole sphere of the conditions of life which environ man and have hitherto ruled man now become under their dominion and the control, for who the first time become the real, conscious lord of nature, because he has now become the master of his own social organization. The laws of his own social action, hitherto standing face to face with man as laws of nature foreign to and dominating him, will then be used with full understanding, and so mastered by him. Man's own social organization, hitherto confronting him as a social necess necessity imposed by nature and history, now becomes the result of his own free action. The extraneous objective forces that have hitherto governed history passed out under the control of man himself. Only from that time will man himself more and more consciously make his own history. Only from that time will the social causes set in movement by him have, in the main and in the constantly growing measure, the results intended by him. It is the ascent of man from the kingdom of necessity to the kingdom of freedom. Let us briefly sum up our sketch of historical evolution. 1. Medieval Society Individual production on a small scale, means of production adapted for individual use, hence primitive, ungainly, petty, dwarfed in action. Production for immediate consumption, either for, of the producer himself or the feudal lord. Only where there is an excess of production over this consumption occurs is such excess offered for sale, enters then into exchange. Production of commodities, therefore, only in its infancy. But already it contains within itself, in embryo, anarchy in the production of society at large. 
Two, capitalist revolution. Transformation of industry at first by means of simple cooperation and manufacture. Concentration of the means of production hitherto scattered into great workshops. As a consequence, their transformation from individual to social means of production, a transformation which does not on the whole affect the form of exchange. The old forms of appropriation remain in force. The capitalist appears. In his capacity as owner of the means of production, he also appropriates the products and turns them into commodities. Production has become a social act. Exchange and appropriation continue to be individual acts and the acts of individuals. The social product is appropriated by the individual capitalist. Fundamental contradiction. Whence arise all other contradictions which our present-day society moves and which modern industry brings to light? A. Severance of the producer from the means of production. Condemnation of the worker to wage labor for life. Antagonism between the proletariat and bourgeoisie. B. Growing predominance and increasing effectiveness of the laws governing the production of commodities. Unbridled competition. Contradiction between socialized organization in the individual factory and the social anarchy in production as a whole. C. On the one hand, perfecting of machinery made by competition compulsory for each individual manufacturer and complemented by a constantly growing displacement of laborers, the Industrial Reserve Army. On the other hand, unlimited extension of production also compulsory under competition for every manufacturer. On both sides of unheard of development of production forces, excess of supply over demand, overproduction, glutting of the markets, crisis every 10 years, the vicious circle, excess here of means of production and products, excess there of laborers, without employment and without means of existence. But these two levers of production and of social well-being are unable to work together because the capitalist form of production prevents the productive forces from working and the products from circulating unless they are first turned into capital, which they're very sub superabundance prevents. The contradiction has grown into an absurdity. The motor production rises in rebellion against the form of exchange. The bourgeoisie are convicted of incapacity further to manage their own social productive forces. D. Partial recognition of the social character of the productive forces forced upon the capitalists themselves, taking over the great institutions for production and communication, first by joint stock companies, later on by trusts, then finally by the state. The bourgeoisie demonstrated to be superfluous class. All its social functions are now performed by salary employees. Number three, proletarian revolution. Solution of the contradictions. The proletariat seizes the public power and by means of this transforms the socialized means of production, slipping from the hands of the bourgeoisie into public property. By this act, the proletarian frees the means of production from the character of capital they have thus far borne and gives their socialized character complete freedom to work itself out. Socialized production upon the predetermined plan becomes henceforth possible. The development of production makes the existence of different classes of society henceforth an anachronism. In proportion to as anarchy in social production vanishes, the political authority of the state dies out. Man, at last the master of his own form of social organization, becomes at the same time lord over nature, his own master, free. To accomplish this act of universal emancipation is the historical mission of the modern proletariat. To thoroughly comprehend the historical conditions and thus the very nature of this act, to impart to the new oppressed proletarian class a full knowledge of the conditions of and the meaning of this momentous act, it is called upon to accomplish. This is the task of the theoretical expression of the proletarian movement, scientific socialism. So that is Ingalls' Socialism, Scientific and Utopian. And I think now after you get a sense of, of what it really says, why it is such an important thing that all socialists or anyone interested in socialist thought should read. Again, I would recommend this to Jordan Peterson. I really think that this encapsulates a really uh, a good summation of a lot of different important Marxist principles. And I love the idea of expressing the fundamental contradiction in capitalist society as the idea of the difference between social production and individual appropriation. I think that that is a great way of looking at uh, even w what that produces, which is the inequality that we see in society and the uh, massive wealth that is consolidated at the top and the absolute nothingness at the bottom. <laughs>
All right. Well, this has been quite a long episode. I know it takes a little while to uh, go through this, but I think hearing the actual words of state of socialism, utopian and scientific is uh, a good exercise and something that um, I haven't seen out there before. So I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, I'll see you later.